David was a buddy of ours. He was my best buddy. Therefore, it was great that he got along with the girl I started dating and then proposed to. He promptly volunteered to be my best man for the wedding. When my fiancé found out, she was overjoyed and said it would be ideal. I suspected her giddiness, but not enough to inquire about it. She was pals with him, after all. So, fast forward to the week before our wedding. My soon-to-be bride was quite excited and had been on her phone a lot. I figured it was all wedding preparation because she'd be on her phone and halt me in my tracks to ask which option I preferred between the two. These options didn't really matter to me. I responded to make her happy. I now know what I know. I believe she would make up questions to ask me so that I would not suspect her of speaking with another man. My best guy, to be precise. She and I had our bachelor parties on the same night. It was really disheartening for me when my best man called to say he couldn't make it to the bachelor party. He had planned for me. He told me that his mother had been admitted to the hospital unexpectedly and that he needed to be with her. So this was completely forgiven, right? How could I be so cold to deny or distrust him? I still had a few buddies with me throughout the night. I'm an active man, so we all played basketball outside before getting nice and clean and heading to an exclusive lounge downtown. I felt like royalty, and I hoped my fiancé felt the same way. We were already living together at this point, but we agreed not to have sex the month before the wedding. I had no idea how difficult it would be. Each night, we took turns sleeping on the pull-out bed in the living room. When I returned home that night, my fiancé had already slept on our bed. She resembles an angel who partied for the first time tonight. I talked her in as she slept, but when I looked around, I noticed something shining on the floor on the side of the bed. I grabbed it up and examined it carefully. It was a nice gold cufflink. How fascinating. My wheels immediately began whirling. My girlfriend did not possess any cufflinks, and I only had one set that did not resemble this one. That could indicate that another man was in our bedroom. I began rashly rubbing my face, head, and neck. This was stressful. My fiancé's phone just went off. It was merely set to vibrate, but I could hear it from the nightstand. While she slept, I stood next to her and read her texts. The string with my best man jumped out to me. His most recent text came four hours earlier at 9 p.m. As I scrolled up, I noticed she had invited him to her bachelorette party, which wasn't how things usually worked. The situation deteriorated significantly further up. She assured him that tonight would be their night, because the next day, she would be mine. He asked her if he'd ever get to have her again. She implied that if he enticed her too much, he might get away with it. Messages from months ago revealed how their conversation evolved from strictly friendship to flirtation. He continued asking about her body, and she started exhibiting him. They made plans to hang together one day when I assumed she was at work. He then messaged her asking if they should have done it. She said, I've never been more sure of anything. Just like that. Within an hour, I changed from being a happy man preparing to marry to a broken-hearted man contemplating revenge. I sent myself six screenshots of the worst messages they sent, clearly increasing in intensity. I intended to read these texts when I was scheduled to read my vows. It was going to be dreadful, just as what she did to me was horrible. I destroyed all evidence collection records. Then I took NyQuil and crashed. She had already left by the next morning. She left me an old-fashioned handwritten note stating that she departed early to get her hair and makeup done. Imagine getting all suited up only to have someone reveal that you are a cheater in front of all of your friends and family. What a wonderful day. At this point, I was just bitter. I didn't miss her or want her to apologize. I was ready to dump her because I couldn't believe how much she allowed me to adore her. She was my only one. I was one of two. I got dressed quite nicely. I smelled great. And my hair was never more on point. Part of me felt it was for nothing. But I convinced myself that it was worthwhile. I considered alerting my father about what I intended to do, but I didn't want him to convince me otherwise or warn others. My best friend just texted me to see if I was on my way to the venue. As soon as I arrived there, he greeted me outdoors. He was dressed really beautifully, but all I needed to know was whether he wore cufflinks in a gamble. I pretended to notice that he was missing one. I couldn't really tell. He was astonished. I noticed and appeared ashamed. He explained that it must have gotten hooked on something somewhere since he lost it. I asked to see the one he needed to close in case I found the match. At this point, his heart was fighting to escape his chest. He was perspiring. 
I was amused by this, but I pretended dumb. He showed me the cufflink, which was exactly the same as the one I had found and was carrying in my pocket at the time. I stared at him intently for a few anxious seconds. I was trying to keep myself from screaming or striking him. He could see it and asked whether I was all right. I snapped out of it and gave a phony smile. I told him that I was okay. I was getting married today. I slapped him hard on the back, causing him to jump. I just entered the arena after the mind-numbing, mingling, and spectacular parade. I realized I would never want to have a typical wedding again. It all seemed so foolish and pointless. That was when my future wife walked down the aisle. She looked as stunning as ever, and all the memories of how we met and how long we'd been together flooded my mind. It was incredibly unfair, and I sobbed. People around me appeared to realize that I was not happy crying. I was devastated. I could barely control my tears until the celebrant asked if I wanted to read my vows. This was it. I began reading messages between James and my fiancé. I specified the date and time for each one. It seemed unusual at first that everyone was waiting patiently for me to get to the point. But, as they listened, I began to read flirtatious texts that neither of them would be proud of. They began to squirm uneasily and looked around, realizing that everyone in the building was watching at them. Brian asked what I was doing and what I was reading. After another text, she instructed me to stop. Then I read the really improper messages, with him telling her he needed to bury himself inside her again and her inviting him over because I had left the home. Everyone was now talking amongst themselves, and my fiancé was attempting to get my phone for me. My best man abruptly walked out, but he was pursued by five of my groomsmen as she attempted to take my phone. I yelled that I had images and videos that they had emailed each other if anyone wanted to see them. When others started getting up and leaving, the celebrant inquired if we were still getting married, to which I laughed loudly and sarcastically. My ex was now kneeling at the altar, sobbing in her white dress. Her bridesmaids didn't know what to do. They just stood there, frozen. Some of them may have known she was sleeping with him or noticed them flirting. It was wonderful to watch that. Nobody went to her side to make her feel better. I walked outdoors to see what had happened to my best man. His automobile became caught between the five men. They were yelling and screaming at him, unable to believe he would betray me at this time. I was done with the drama. My head hurt. I felt like I had gotten my revenge, and all I needed to do now was take a nap. I instructed them to back off and let him go, that keeping him here wouldn't help anything. Just as they backed off, my future bride dashed out of the event. She was pursued by her bridesmaids, who spurned her and called her a disgusting person. She rushed behind the best man's automobile for approximately ten yards before he noticed her in the rearview mirror and came to a halt. She entered, and they departed. I turned around to see the majority of our wedding guests observing what had just happened. Many of them approached me and gave hugs and advice. It was bizarre. It seemed like I was suddenly at a grief counseling session with a mix of our family and friends. Well, they were no longer her buddies. Neither of them received any assistance or communication from the folks they had relied on and knew so well. They relocated out of state together, but only stayed together for a year. My ex moved back in with her after being disillusioned by her criticism of parents. What a huge waste of time. She tried to ask me out again after all of this, and I called her insane. I have still not heard from my best friend. That is okay. I couldn't be friends with him anymore. My friends and family never let me lose up hope or become very depressed. I haven't begun dating again, but I do know a nice girl. I'm going to ask out. It's hard to comprehend that someone would just be with me. That's because my ex planted the seed of mistrust. The only way I know to combat this is to be cautious while approaching individuals. Ask them whatever I want to know and tell them what happened to me so they understand where I'm coming from. Wow, OP. Not many people go through the stress you did here. I admire your fortitude and determination to collect and recite letters during the wedding for everyone to hear. I believe this was the greatest approach for her to learn from her error. I'm delighted to hear you received so much support that day and thereafter. You did not deserve to be betrayed by your best friend, let alone your fiancé. I appreciated hearing your story and discovering that, although escaping criticism together, they did not survive long. Each of them had to feel even more guilty after that. I believe at that time they realized they had also fouled up their own lives. Not just everyone they cherished. It appears that you know how to keep pushing forward. Here is the next story.
Umpire Billy Golden made a loud announcement when he completed the top half of the third inning at Little Admiral Fetterman Field in Pensacola, Florida, home of the Pensacola Blue Wahoos, the Miami Marlins' double-A club. Scout Sam Casper took his normal perch on the Admiral to monitor the Marlins' progress. Two years ago, the number one overall draft pick was made, David Golden Eagle Boyd. It was his second visit to Pensacola this season. The major club appeared to be hopeful that last year's rookie would make an impact by September, and they trusted no one more than Casper, who had been scouting for them for 18 years. Boyd, who has a strong 286 batting average with 12 home runs and 36 RBIs through mid-June, has so far justified the $1.75 million bonus the Marlins gave him when he joined last year. Casper believed the 6'4", 240-pound 24-year-old could hit with average and power while playing first base and running like the wind, putting him one notch behind Mike's potential fish of the Angels, widely regarded as the greatest player in the game. Boyd exuded confidence as he stepped to the plate as Pensacola's third baseman. His long, wavy, blonde hair poked out from beneath his baseball hat. His massive biceps and triceps filled out the short sleeves of his uniform. Almost every woman in the little stadium sat up straighter and focused more on the baseball player. Home attendance has grown this year, particularly among women. Casper was holding a notepad and a pen, recording the game's progress and his observations. He may have been the only man in the crowd who focused on the baseball player rather than the women. With the bases empty and one out, Boyd nodded the game before launching a 96 miles per hour shot over the wall in left field. The stadium exploded in applause. Casper took notes while madly smiling from ear to ear. The Marlins selected Boyd with their first pick, based on his advice. Boyd scored another run later in the game, and the Blue Wahoos won 4-2. Casper jotted down a few more notes in his notepad before proceeding to the Wahoo locker room to speak with Boyd and the Wahoo manager. Alyssa Graber and Tracy Strickland sat at a corner table at La Scala, a premium restaurant, enjoying a slice of cheesecake and a glass of Galliano. Both women were in their thirties, well-dressed, and appeared comfortable in their circumstances. Davy Boyd and Arturo Gonzalez appeared out of place the moment they walked in. They had come to the restaurant to celebrate their victory the day before and were shown to a table in the center of the room. Tracy remarked, I'll take that blonde guy over there indicating to Davy. Elisa followed Tracy's eyes to the two baseball players. Please, these two have probably not read a book since Sally, Privates, and Jane. Ten dollars says they'll both get burgers. Alyssa replied she agreed. Do you know them? Tracy asked. All I know is that they are both members of the local baseball club. Your fantasy boy, their outstanding rookie, received a large contract. Handsome and wealthy. Always a good mix. Tracy spoke slowly, breaking into a smile as the two jocks gazed at the women. "'Does it disturb you that they are possibly young enough to be our younger brothers?' asked Alyssa. "'I do not want to buy one. Simply rent one.' Tracy remarked this while flashing her wonderfully white teeth at the players. "'Look at this,' Davy said as he turned to Arturo. "'A couple of lovely ladies just waiting for company. Davy, as a player with a large salary and bonus, typically paid as he did when out with his teammates. He summoned the waitress and instructed her to deliver two drinks to the women at the corner table. Did you know that these two women are married, and the one with short hair is Mayor Richard Strickland's wife? asked the waitress. That's normal, Davy responded. I only want to buy them a drink, not rent them for the evening. The waitress smiled and did what she was told. The players watched the waitress serve the drinks before raising their glasses to the women, the women answered in kind. The players ate their burgers while watching the women converse. Darn, guy, have you won over that adorable little blonde yet? asked Arturo. What is the point, Artie? We're having fun, but we aren't married. Besides, nothing beats a married woman. I did not realize you had a degree in women's studies. My heart is with you, Professor. Both baseball guys laughed. Alyssa was the banker's wife. She was 36 years old with long blonde hair, a lovely face, blue eyes, and a voluptuous figure. Her companion at the table was 35 years old with shoulder-length dark brown hair, a tiny chest buttocks, and a slightly too tight and short skirt. The mayor's wife understood she still had something that could pique a man's interest and was not as bashful about flaunting it as the mayor would have liked. You owe me $1.10? Alyssa noticed. 
Before approaching the women's table, the players finished their hamburgers. Would you like company for a while? Asked Davy. Who do you have in mind for us? Tracy responded sarcastically. Davy merely thought about the answer briefly. He was a seasoned professional who dealt with women and saw Tracy's remark as the opening shot. He figured Arturo could handle the quieter one. Well, you have a sharp tongue. I thought about myself. Arturo is more of a gentleman here. I believe he would be a fantastic companion for your girlfriend. By the way, my name is Davy Arturo, and I play for the city's baseball team, the Blue Wahoos. My name is Tracy, and I have a friend named Alyssa. I believe we can discuss intriguing issues for a while if you can manage it. Arturo appears capable of handling the situation. Perhaps he can make it up to both of you. Wow. Davy stated that the four spent time together over their second drink, and around two hours before they left Waze, Davy requested and obtained Tracy's phone number. Did you really just give him your number? Elisa was perplexed. Do you remember that you were married? A little flirtation, perhaps a little more. Never harm anyone. I can tell he's a player. I'll simply toy with him a little. Tracy laughed. If only you understood what you were doing. Alyssa commented before going away in a different direction. Arturo questioned Davy. Are you giving up on Blonde? Why did you believe I did something stupid? Davy answered. Blondie and Tracy do not share the same social group. If only you knew what you were doing, Arturo said blonder, explaining why gamers referred to her as a 20-year-old Pensacola local named Jenna Wyatt. She came up in the team's locker room after the season opener and has been with Davy ever since. Over the last month, the couple had love two to three times per week. Jenna was hardly a naive city girl, despite having only graduated from high school two years before. Her number had already reached double digits. She was a young woman with a strong, sexual appetite who was not afraid to pursue her desires. She currently hopes to be the star of the city's baseball team. The day following the game. Jenna was waiting for Davy in a tight black short-sleeved top and tight slender pants that highlighted her firmness. However, Davy assumed that when he spotted Jenna, they would leave the park and go to the property Davy had rented. We're stopping for pizza along the way, after eating pizza and having a few beers. Davy and Jenna headed to the main bedroom and king-sized bed. Halfway to the bed, Davy kissed Jenna passionately after looking deeply into her hazel eyes. Jenna's knees buckled before Davy positioned her on her back on the bed. When his breathing returned to normal... Davy grabbed a towel from the bathroom and headed into the kitchen for two more beers. They drank the chilly liquid slowly before going back to bed for another round. Tracy did not recognize the phone number that flashed on her screen at first. She then remembered that she had given this young baseball player her phone number four days earlier. She gave a big laugh. She didn't expect him to call knowing she was married. He was either extremely arrogant or incredibly ignorant. She thought as she hit the answer button. Davy. How are you doing? Tracy replied with the kindest tone. Tracy, you're doing quite good. I was sitting in my room thinking about today's game when you came into my mind and I decided to call. Are you at home or on the road? Tracy asked. Davy was surprised to learn about away games from their talk that evening. Davy had the feeling that she understood nothing about sports and was even less interested in them. We'll be in Birmingham for a few days before returning home. I was hoping we could meet for a short dessert and a drink on Thursday evening. If you are busy, you are welcome to bring your husband. I would like to meet the mayor. I'd never officially met the mayor before. I believe you two are quite a powerful couple. Tracy detected a tinge of sarcasm in Davy's voice. She knew he didn't want her husband to participate, but she was impressed that Davy was willing to play the game. Tracy was fascinated. He has a council meeting on Thursday night, but I would love to join you, young man. Tracy responded by adding the ID as her method of playing the game. The two got to know each other better over glasses of Amaretto Diorono and slices of cheesecake. Tracy kept the discussion neutral, allowing Davy to dictate the course of the evening. He waited around 20 minutes before shifting the conversation to a more intimate topic. You are a beautiful woman. Does your husband mind that you occasionally meet men for drinks? asked Davy. Sometimes I date dudes. Sometimes I date ladies. I have a diverse group of friends. My hubby is aware of this. He also knows he can trust me, despite the fact that he is aware of my flirtatious nature. Flirting! Davy, a small child, commented, I do a little flirting. How far can this flirtation go? How far do you want him to go? 
Tracy answered. Davy's face lit up with a slow smile. He extended his hands across the table. Tracy placed her hands in his. Evan McComb watched as a cute blonde bounced approached the Starbucks checkout station from a table in the back. He saw the light freckles on the bridge of her upturned nose and the brightness in her hazel eyes. He also noted that her miniskirt barely reached the middle of her slim legs. He knew she came here on a regular basis, but it took him about a month to muster the bravery to approach her. He stood up from his seat and waited at the door as she came. Evan made his move and introduced himself to her. The young woman was stunned at first, but soon responded warmly to Evan's introduction. She had previously seen him in a cafe and was amazed by his nice manners and the way he sat in his suits. They returned to the table. Evan had just departed, and we talked for approximately five minutes before Jenna said she had to return to work. Evan gave the young woman his phone so she could add her number to his contacts. Evan nearly returned to his profession as an accountant. His co-workers noted that the normally reticent accountant appeared upbeat as he went around the office at 4 o'clock p.m. Evan's employer, Phil Cunningham, stepped into his office and asked whether he had won the lotto. I obtained a phone number for the future. Mrs. Evan McComb this morning, Evan said. Phil was Evan's boss for two years. The young man liked him, but he had never seen him speak so enthusiastically about his connection with a woman, especially since they hadn't even gone on a date. The following day, Evan called Jenna. They scheduled a dinner date at one of Evan's favorite seafood restaurants for the next Saturday night. Evan let out a big sigh as Jenna opened the door to her apartment, dressed in her own version of the tiny black dress. His brief scan indicated that she was not wearing a bra beneath the thin material, as her nipples were clearly hard, and it came down about a few inches below her round. But Evan figured she'd have to be very careful when she sat down. Does that sound like approbation or are you experiencing an asthma attack? Jenna proposed. Certainly sounds like an endorsement, but now I'm afraid since I didn't have a baseball bat to fight off the guys. Did someone compliment you? Jenna laughed, and Evan was quite certain it was the most beautiful sound he'd ever heard. Dinner and discussion were delightful. It was natural for Jenna to compare Evan to Dave throughout the evening. Although Dave triumphed in most physical areas, Jenna recognized that Evan was far from a troll, and she had to confess to herself that she seemed to connect with him on a deeper level than Dave. However, because it was their first date, Sarah and Evan did not talk about their previous dates. They may have to discuss this topic in the future, but for the time being, they were both content to be together. The evening concluded with a gentle kiss at Jenna's door. The following evening did not end with a simple kiss at Jenna's door. Jenna and Davy had a deep, passionate kiss before moving inside for a long night of Carnival of Passion. Evan was distant from her mind. Tracy was delighted with how her relationship with the young athlete was progressing. He proved to be more educated and well-read than she had expected, and they had a good time visiting a neighboring museum and attending the opening of an art exhibition. At an art display, the couple ran into numerous of Tracy and her husband's acquaintances, and Dave was taken aback by Tracy's apparent comfort in being seen publicly with him. Tracy appeared as traditional as her husband— but she felt that in another time and place, she could have been a more upbeat lady. The only visible signs of this were her flirtatious nature and a little tattoo on her left wrist, which was normally buried beneath many bangles. Tracy's friends didn't appear disturbed or astonished by her relationship with the young athlete, though it did raise some eyebrows among their husbands. Almost all of her pals were aware that Tracy was a flirt, but it seemed a little much for their guys. Several of these men worried how much her husband, the mayor, knew about her new interest. In truth, Mayor Richard Strickland was unaware of his wife's most recent actions, despite her flirting tendencies, which occasionally went too far for his comfort. He always relied on his wife to know where to draw the line. Tracy was the contented wife of a successful lawyer for the first 11 years of their marriage, until the lawyer decided a little more than two years ago that he needed to become mayor of the little town where they resided at the age of 41. Richard was six years older than his wife, yet he also appeared younger. His short brown hair showed no signs of graying, and regular gym sessions helped him maintain a toned and somewhat muscular physique. Most people believed that he was a lovely man, though not as attractive as his gorgeous wife. 
the autumn elections were not very difficult. Richard received around two-thirds of the votes. The majority of his constituents appeared to believe that he would bring the same strong work ethic to City Hall that he had in his previous legal career. Richard, like most mayors, attended numerous meetings and likely did not devote as much time to his job as he did when he first began his law firm employment. Some of his colleagues wondered if he was spending too much time as mayor at the expense of his marriage, especially after seeing Tracy with Davy. Tracy served as the executive director of a city-based non-profit organization. The position required just approximately 30 hours per week, allowing her to maintain a social life while also remaining a visible presence in the community. Tracy would often spend multiple lunches per week with some of the community's most powerful business leaders. Tracy and Davy have just begun to share small kisses in public. Tracy observed that in certain companies this was not surprising. She began to touch Davy more freely particularly his arms and chest. She knew Davy would eventually become her first lover. Although she knew to herself that it was wrong, her growing attraction to the young man was overshadowed by her guilt, despite the fact that she adored her husband. Deep down, her lusty feelings convinced her that this was what she was destined to do. Jenna felt no guilt as she laid in Evan's arms after the couple had just made love. Jenna grinned to herself since she had just had fantastic love with two different men on consecutive days. Neither man discusses it. Exclusive. And Jenna planned to appreciate all both men had to offer until a decision had to be made. Mayor Richard Strickland and three other men sat in a darkened area of the city's only upscale Hungarian restaurant. They were discussing funding specifics for a distribution center that was in talks to relocate to the city. The distribution center might provide several hundred employment and tax money for the city. He had to focus on the meeting. However, his attention was briefly diverted when he noticed his wife, accompanied by the star of the city's baseball team, Davy Boyd, enter the restaurant and sit at a table on the other side of the facility. Wow, he's a lovely large man, the mayor pondered to himself. She's becoming more confident these days. He took another five seconds to reflect on what he had observed. Then he returned his focus to the gathering. What Mayor Strickland didn't notice was Tracy wearing the tight black micro skirt she had bought specifically for Davy. She was definitely braless beneath her silky black blouse. Tracy had never seen Davy so animated. He was the day's hero, hitting two home runs and scoring three runs. He informed Tracy that she had no idea what the attractive young man was talking about, but she knew it was something positive. Based on his smile and the light in his eyes, she knew she was going to take their relationship to the next level tonight. Davy calmed down during supper, and Tracy watched his shift with quiet pride, knowing she had helped shape this young man's personality. How about we take dessert to go? Tracy offered, gazing at him with her trademark gorgeous smile. Richard won't get home till midnight. We have just under three hours to eat this dessert. Yes, exclaimed Davy excitedly. Tracy removed her little skirt after 15 seconds of entering Davy's residence. He admired her tight buttocks. He put both hands on her buttocks and pulled her in for an open kiss, as they lay there regaining their breath. They both had similar thoughts. This was the finest love they had ever experienced. Richard Strickland entered his home at 12.30 p.m., half walking and half stumbling, feeling victorious. His presence and efforts aided in the establishment of a distribution center in his community, resulting in several job opportunities and tax money. The agreement was reached over a delicious dinner and several drinks at the fancy Hungarian restaurant Maguire. Now he was gently walking up the steps. He recalls seeing Davy Boyd, the executive director of one of the city's largest charitable groups, in the restaurant with his wife during the Dublin baseball team's visit. Tracy could have been dating the player for a multitude of valid reasons, but his extremely organized wife would have informed him beforehand. He couldn't recall any conversation in which she told him she was going to meet Boyd. Richard knew his wife was a great flirt and had all the characteristics to back it up. But he also believed that her flirtation was just that, nothing more. Throughout their ten-year marriage, he had occasional reservations— but every time he looked into something, Tracy turned out to be innocent. He thought things would be the same this time. Tracy was the most knowledgeable legal advisor. Richard had ever recruited at his law office, Atterbury Solano Strickland LLP. They began dating a year after she started working and married. One year after their romance began, 
She left the law company shortly after they started dating and started working for a non-profit a few months after their wedding. Richard was 31 years old when they were married. Before meeting Tracy, he had two long-term relationships. He was a gorgeous and successful lawyer, so finding women to date was never an issue. Tracy's flirty personality occasionally caused problems in their marriage. Her spouse continually informed her that her flirtation with him in their city social circles was terribly insulting. Come on, Richie, you know I'm not saying anything serious. Tracy explained, It's just for fun. Please consider my feelings from time to time. Tracy, Richard responded. To avoid waking his wife, Richard undressed gently in the darkness of the bedroom. He carefully crawled between the sheets and rubbed against Tracy, first sniffing her skin, then her hair. The smell of soap and shampoo was still strong, indicating that she had showered a little earlier before bed. Because Tracy did not generally shower before bed, Richard realized his wife was no longer his, so he turned in bed with his back to her. As he fell asleep, a tear rolled from his eye. So who is your current boyfriend? Girlfriend? Sheila Williamson asked her old friend Jenna Wyatt as they concluded their meal. Jenna blushed furiously, wondering if she should tell her buddy the truth about dating two men at the same time. She pondered why she felt guilty about this when neither man had mentioned exclusivity, perhaps because Sheila had known Jenna long enough to recognize that at 20, she was far from a virgin. Sheila noticed the deep redness and knew what it meant. So I believe the question is not who, but how many. Sheila giggled. Come on, lay it out. Jenna looked down to the floor before catching her friend's gaze. She informed her about Davy and Evan. Wait, you are dating this piece of baseball meat? How is that? Sheila asked. Jenna answered, He's all you see. He's large. He has muscles. He has money. He looks fantastic. And he's fantastic in bed. But this other guy makes me perplexed. Not as huge and not as muscular. Certainly not the same money. But he is also attractive and good in bed. And I don't know. There's something about him that stimulates me in a way Davy cannot. We can chat about everything, and he's a pleasure to talk to. And I miss him when I'm alone. I don't miss Dave as much when I'm alone. Does this make sense? This sounds suspiciously like love, dear. Sheila advised you to check if you can't keep him before he moves to someone else. A baseball player may be entertaining, but love is precious. Jenna, act immediately to secure your claim to him. Jenna peered directly into her friend's eyes. She noticed that Sheila was dead serious. Sometimes when Davy calls, I know he just wants to be loved, Jenna admitted. Evan wants to be with me. Love is an addiction. And here is your response to that question, Jenna. Despite this chat, Jenna was quick to say yes when Davy contacted to set up a date for two days later and sent her a ticket to the game. They were going to go together afterward. Evan and his friend Scott Segura had great seats for Thursday's Wahoo game when Davy Boyd blasted a two-run home run in the sixth inning. The stadium exploded with cheers. Evan, who was approximately five rows from Wahoo first base, thought he heard a familiar voice in the hubbub. The players, family, and friends sat three rows ahead of him straight behind the benches. That was Jenna. She was elegantly dressed, yet appeared to be alone. Evan said nothing to his friend, but continued to observe Jenna for the next few innings. He spotted Davy standing up and looking directly at the young blonde many times, and she appeared to wave in his direction once or twice. Evan wasn't born yesterday, and he recognized what he was seeing. He was perplexed, but as he sat in the stands and reflected, he realized that neither he nor Jenna had ever promised to be exclusive. He understood this was something he needed to address. If she didn't already have a relationship with the baseball player, Evan pointed Jenna out to his friend and told him about their relationship thus far. When the game concluded, the two men secretly observed the young woman. When Davy exited the stadium, Jenna practically jumped into his muscular arms and they drove away in Davies's new car. Tracy didn't notice the nondescript black vehicle that followed her into the Italian restaurant's parking lot. The driver of that automobile parked near enough to picture her and observe her enter the restaurant several minutes before Davy did. He opened Clive Cussler's heavy book, knowing that he had at least an hour to read before dinner. It took the couple little longer that night. They left the restaurant together, then went to Davy's house in separate cars. The sedan followed both cars at a safe distance. The motorist snapped a photo of Tracy as she drove past. Her hair was unkempt and her makeup had washed off. 
He then drove to Mayor Richard Strickland's office and waited until the council meeting was over. Before entering the mayor's office, private investigator Mark Garten waited until the mayor was fully alone before banging on the door. The mayor knew the man as he walked into the office. His bedroom is on the second level, so I couldn't get any actual images of them together. But based on how it looked before and after entering the player's residence, only a fool or a Puritan would believe they didn't have love. And based on what you've told me about her later souls, I believe that's apparent. Thank you, Mr. Garten replied. Mayor Strickland hands the detective a payment for his services. After the investigator left, the mayor buried his face in his hands and sobbed like a kid. Breakfast at the Strickland house the next morning was quiet, but Tracy was clearly in a happy mood, humming as she strolled around the kitchen. Richard appeared depressed as he sat at the kitchen table. You don't look very nice, sweetie. Tracy said that if your stomach is upset, we have Alka-Seltzer in the restroom. I keep a gun in my gun safe. That would make me feel better, too. The mayor pondered to himself. Tracy noticed no indication that her spouse had any suspicions about her behavior. She always thought she was smarter than her husband, forgetting that his passive conduct did not reflect his intelligence. Tracy believed that she loved her husband deeply, but she also believed that she earned her romance with the young baseball star. She thought her spouse was totally decent in bed, but Davy was at least two steps ahead and she deserved it. She was aware that what she was doing was technically wrong, but it was so nice that she felt no shame. She knew it was a cliché, but her affair was all about the great love. When this is over, she will return to her role as a loving, caring wife. Richard observed his wife whistling merrily as she moved around the kitchen, her wrath building. He realized that he and Tracy had not been intimate for perhaps a month prior to this. They had loved two or three times a week, and Richard did not believe they had any troubles in that sense. As in many households, the woman set the agenda at home. Prior to their marriage, the couple had no serious discussions about children. However, roughly two years after their marriage, Tracy decided she did not want children. She and Richard had several intense conversations about it, but Tracy won out and Richard had a vasectomy. Jenna didn't realize Evan hadn't phoned her in a week because she was preoccupied with work and dating two men at once. The following week, midway during her relationship with Davy, Jenna realized she hadn't heard from her other suitor. When Jenna arrived home, it was too late to call Evan, so she called him the next day. She had to call the young accountant for the first time during her lunch break. Did I do something wrong, Evan? Jenna inquired when Evan answered the third call. Evan carefully pondered his two possibilities. Tell Jenna what he knew about her relationship with Davy, or simply let it end. There was roughly ten seconds of silence on the line. Jenna, I understand you're dating both a baseball star and me. I know we never discussed exclusivity but I can't cope with you dating and sleeping with two guys at the same time. I understand I don't have his money and I'm not a big, tough guy, but I want to be the only one in your life. I'd like to find out whether we have anything else. Jenna's eyes widened at the end of the phone call. Even though Evan couldn't see them, she hesitated for a moment before responding. Yes. How about we celebrate our new beginning on Saturday night? Evan said. Jenna did not stutter this time, but rather shouted rapidly. Yes, yes, yes. A few days later, Davy called Jenna to ask for a date. She gently declined, stating that she was already dating another man on exclusive terms. That's terrific for you, but it shouldn't bother us, right? Davy asked. I mean, we weren't looking for Brad or Angelina. We were simply having fun. Can't this continue while you're dating this guy? Sorry, Davy. But aren't you that type of guy? Jenna said. And I will not cheat when I make a pledge. I've had a terrific time with you, but this is probably the end, okay? But if you change your mind, you've got my number. Davy. I love you. I wish you have a successful career. Sam Casper had the distinction of telling Davy of his promotion to the Miami Marlins in September. He arrived at Fetterman Stadium just before kickoff one late August day. Hello, Bubba. My name is Opportunity, and I am knocking. Sam spoke as he approached Davy in the Wahoos locker room. Are you serious, Mr. K.? Davy spoke with much excitement. The old man grinned and nodded. Yes, I will answer, Davy cried as his teammates gathered to congratulate him. Davy's promotion made headlines the next day. Richard Strickland read the story in the newspaper with curiosity. He still adored his wife, but he was hesitant of his next move. 
He called his former law company colleague, Rick Salerno. Tracy's hormones were out of control a week after Davy's phone call. She had been in love with the baseball player two or three times a week for the previous six weeks, and the quick breakup had an impact on her. She heard her husband in his office and realized it had been a long time since they had made love. She tried to recall the last time she and Richard had been intimate, and she concluded that it had been after she began developing feelings for Davy. Tracy claimed that she and Richard had a crazy love life. When did it disappear? When was the last time they shared a hug? Has she really gotten so far away? Tracy felt bad for the first time since the novel's starting in Miami. Davy also missed the frequent affection he shared with Tracy and Jenna. Pitchers in the majors were doing anything they wanted with the young guy, and he still hadn't gone anywhere to meet women. Hey, baby, maybe you can get away for a few days this week. Davy added, I really miss what we had. Tracy answered the phone. God, Davy, I miss you so much. Tracy almost said, Tell me when and I'll be there. That evening, Richard returned home. Tracy informed him that she and Alyssa planned to spend a few days shopping in Miami if he did not mind. This was a common request Tracy had made and Richard had granted throughout the years. Richard, on the other hand, had not expected this request and tried hard to conceal his surprise. Was she so desperate that she was willing to believe her husband suspected nothing? Was it more than just love? How much of a betrayal, Richard puzzled. Richard tried to hide the deep breath he needed to take before agreeing. Tracy had just given him the definitive answer, he reasoned. Tracy boarded a taxi from the airport to Davy's rented apartment. She flung herself into the young man's arms and kissed his lips. As soon as he opened the door, he kissed her back for around 30 seconds before gently setting her down. I want you so much right now, but I have to attend a baseball game. It's the major leagues, baby. We'll eat dinner when I get back. I am so delighted you are here. You'll be glad you came, Davy exclaimed aloud. Tracy felt more energized and lively than she had since Davy's departure. She opened her suitcase, revealing a gorgeous red baby doll and matching undergarments. Perhaps it was the thought that Tracy was waiting for him at home. Perhaps it was just the beginning of many fantastic nights. However, Davy had two hits, including his first home run in the major leagues and scored three runs. He got some Chinese food on the way home and virtually threw open his apartment door when he got home. Tracy was enjoying a glass of wine while spread out on his couch with one leg bent. He set the bag of Chinese food on the kitchen table, where it sat for the next two hours until a tired and sweaty Davy and Tracy found it. Richard was thinking about his divorce petition around the time Davy and Tracy settled into Davy's shower the next morning. It was an easy split down the middle, but Richard only agreed to pay alimony for five years, as long as Tracy paid her own rent and Davy did not reside with her. Richard knew it was juvenile, but it could have been the only way he could win in court. Evan was overjoyed when he learned about Davy's promotion to the first team in September. He had placed entire trust in Jenna when she vowed to remain with him exclusively. But it was a huge relief that Davy was no longer living in town. Jenna understood Dave's elevation as excellent news for him, but she didn't care because she had pledged to be with Evan. Davy was no longer in town. Davy and Tracy spent the majority of their three days in Miami indulging in love and dining at various upscale restaurants. When Davy wasn't playing baseball, he observed Tracy's skirts and dresses were a little shorter than what she had worn in Pensacola, and he thought they formed an attractive couple together. Tracy felt the gazes of other restaurant clients on her, some because she was with Davy, and others because she knew she looked attractive. She had to confess that living in Miami appeared far more appealing than life in Pensacola. Tracy felt at ease. The cab pulled up in front of her darkened house. She hoped she wouldn't have to speak much with her spouse until the next morning. She had showered earlier in the day before boarding the airline, so she didn't get home smelling like love. Richard sat in the darkened living room with a full glass of bourbon, watching as a cab passenger picked up his bag from the driver in the driveway. He noticed her walking up the two stairs to the front entrance of the house. Hesitate a bit before inserting the key into the lock and entering the residence. Unaware that her spouse was closely watching her, she had to listen to her dull old husband. After three days in love with your billionaire baseball player, Richard asked strongly but quietly, 
Tracy began to lose track of the fact that someone was present in the shadowy room. I... Tracy stumbled, unable to articulate logical sentences and sprang back a foot. She stayed where she could scarcely see her spouse. The gloom. I know precisely what you're thinking, he added. How did your naive, unsuspecting, forced spouse learn about your vacation and your lover in the first place? Richard drank while Tracy watched him in the dark. Although she and many people assumed she was brighter than her husband, she was absolutely caught aback and left speechless. Do not worry, Richard said sarcastically. Alyssa did not give you away. I knew you were going alone, so I called her house when Glenn answered the phone. I wanted to speak with Alyssa, and he nearly fell through the floor trying not to lie but telling me she wasn't there. That is the problem. When you employ a woman with a good and honest husband as a disguise... I asked him not to inform Alyssa that I had phoned so she wouldn't have time to warn you. He felt bound to protect my secret. Tracy let out a tiny sigh. She didn't know how much Richard knew, and any defensive comments she may have spoken would have been foolish. In this scenario, silence was her best option. Tracy understood Richard was also aware of the situation, but the more she remained there silently, the angrier he got. When did you cease showing me respect? When did you cease loving me? Richard hissed. I've never stopped loving you, Richard. This has nothing to do with love. Okay, maybe a little, if I am being honest. Wow, honesty. What a terrific idea. Richard raged at his wife. Richard drank another sip of bourbon. Tracy set down her suitcase and sat in the chair. Can I switch on the lights? Tracy said, I'd like to see you when we talk. No, you only want to see my eyes. To determine whether I believe any of your falsehoods. Richard replied fiercely. Be careful. At this point, I've learned the majority of your tricks. The only thing I don't know yet is why. I'm not sure if I can answer that. Tracy mentioned Richard. I'm a huge flirt. We used to debate about it. You were constantly worried I'd cross the boundary, and I always said I'd never do it, but I was mistaken. Something about him captivated me, Richie. I can't explain it. He was sexy and sweet, and I'm not sure what happened to him. And love was. It was great. When we started seeing one other on a regular basis... I realized he was more than just a baseball player. He has brains. In addition to his strength and ability, I guess I'm a little into him and have fallen in love more than once. Tracy sighed. Richard, at the same time, you and I haven't been in love in around three months. You don't need me anymore, and you can't take your hands off that darn boy. Then there was the weekend. Did you even attend the game this weekend? Was it all about love? Do you really need to be so harsh to me, Richard? Tracy reminisced about the last time the couple was in love. She looked up to see Richard staring at her piercingly. I was never unpleasant to you as my wife, but now that you're his, all bets are off, Richard added. I am still your wife, Richard. We need to communicate and figure things out, Tracy stated. No, we don't need to chat, Richard replied. I already knew what I was thinking while you were having pleasure. Seriously, Richie? Go away, Tracy. Tracy rolled her eyes and tightened her lips, but this time she kept mute. So, Richard, do you understand? What do you foresee occurring next? Tomorrow you will be served with divorce papers. You sign papers, and in about 30 days you'll be able to spend your life with your boy, and I'll regain some of my self-respect. That is not how I see it, Richard. I'm confident we can fix it. Yes, I made a mistake, but there is no need to go to extremes. Let us calm down and reconsider this. We've had a communication breakdown here, Richard said, copying Struther, Martin's famous statement from the film Cool Hand Luke. Tracy glanced at Richard with astonishment, polite, peaceful, and stable. Richard appeared to be amused by the prospect of divorce. What is happening here? She questioned herself. Richard relocated his possessions to the couple's guest room. He went upstairs, entered the room, and then locked the door. Tracy sat downstairs, her intellect at full capacity. She never considered the prospect of being caught and the potential ramifications. Tracy was served on Monday morning despite Richard's warnings. She was pretty certain he would call it off. Tracy was nervous since he went forward with the presentation. Tracy had never seen a side of Richard like she had in the last two days. Richard concentrated mostly on his duties as mayor. Over the next few days, as a means to deal with the circumstance... However, it was not too difficult because he adored being mayor of the city. Tracy was having a far more difficult time dealing with the events in her life. 
she spent the rest of Monday in a sort of state, and things did not improve in the days that followed. Davy called her at noon on Thursday. Hello, gorgeous, how are you? Do you miss me? He asked. Tracy's heartbeat quickened when she heard Davy's voice for the first time. Then reality struck her. Richard is aware of us and has been for some time, she responded calmly. He also knows about our weekend excursion. I was served on Monday. Richard, how's your hubby, David? Asked almost rhetorically. He paused on the line, his thoughts racing. Because he knows. Why don't you just come back here and live with me full time, Davy said. We will be back in Pensacola in a few weeks, at least for the winter. Then, depending on where I play next season, we'll look for a location in Miami or Jacksonville. Tracy remained silent this time. This is very correct, she finally spoke excitedly. How about I return to Miami on Saturday? Great, baby, I cannot wait to see you. Please provide me the details. Tracy placed the phone away and sat silently. Within a minute, she realized to herself that, while she loved her husband, her feelings for Davy had grown so strong that she was willing to leave Richard for the young baseball star. I'm sorry, Richard, she said to herself. Richard did not come home for supper on Thursday night, but Tracy was sitting in the darkened living room with a glass of wine when he entered. Around 9 p.m., she thought the scenario was quite humorous and smiled to herself as he startled at her greeting as he stepped through the door. Hey, Tracy, Richard stuttered immediately, understanding he was being set up for something. Let me get myself a beverage and we can discuss. Tracy had to concede that her plan did not appear to place Richard in the position she had anticipated. Richard returned to his room with the beer. He sat down in his chair less than a minute later, smiling wryly at her. Over. Over. Tracy? He chuckled. Tracy was disturbed by Richard's confidence. She started glancing at the floor. Then she realized her spouse was watching her intently in the dark. I'm returning to Miami for a few weeks to be with Davy. We will be back in October. That should allow you some time to think, Tracy stated. Are you out of your mind? exclaimed Richard. You say you don't want a divorce, but you're going back to this guy for a few weeks. I will not be known as a cuckold to anyone. If you leave, you should stay away indefinitely. Richard sprang out of his chair, poured his beer into the sink, and entered the guest room. Tracy smirked after him, convinced that she had recovered control. Tracy adored spending time with Davy when the Marlins were at home. Otherwise, she felt lonely while the Marlins were gone. Davy hung out with younger athletes, all of whom had young spouses or girlfriends. Tracy did not find any common ground with them. She also didn't have much in common with the wives and girlfriends of older players who were knowledgeable about baseball. What I couldn't say of myself, Davy and Tracy returned to Pensacola when the Major League Baseball season concluded in early October. The pair returned to Davy's rented home, but after a few days, Tracy felt it was time to confront Richard. She knew Richard would never take her back at this point, so she returned to her former home to retrieve her remaining possessions and clothes. Tracy was astonished to find that her key no longer worked in any of the house's doors. She was startled that Richard had considered replacing the locks. She needed to ring the front doorbell. The prodigal wife has returned, Richard replied, opening the door. Will we do this now? asked Tracy. Absolutely, Richard answered, smiling broadly. Tracy informed Richard that she had come to collect the remaining items and clothing. Richard led her to the garage, where a series of garbage bags awaited her. He unlocked the garage door and instructed her to load them herself. She snorted with distaste. Richard chuckled before walking away. Tracy knew she hadn't gotten her period after two weeks. She recounted that when she initially came, Miami Davy did not thought to get condoms. Nonetheless, the pair experienced love twice that first night. Before David purchased a dozen the next day, Tracy informed Davy of the news. We can manage anything. I'm confident that the team doctors know who the best doctors are for handling this safely. Davy finally spoke. Tracy began crying silently. She said, I can't do this. I could never do that. It's fine, baby. I've always desired a lot of children. Maybe not this early, but I adore kids, and I have always wanted a bunch of them. I did not mean to, Tracy replied quietly. Tracy was four months pregnant when she and Richard signed the divorce papers. He hadn't seen her since she moved to live with Davy and had no idea she was pregnant. When he first observed her new respect for your sweetheart, Tracy, his face was filled with shock. 
You never wanted to have children with me, but he must be lot more manly. I can't say you were careless, Kenny. Tracy reddened but said nothing. Richard's lawyer swiftly informed everyone present that using Richard's name on the birth certificate would be regarded a falsehood under oath. Davy knows it's his child and has already agreed to pay for the birth and child support. Tracy replied quietly. Davy was promoted to AAA Jacksonville during the next season. Tracy would be seven months pregnant at the start of the triple season, so they decided she'd stay in Pensacola until the baby arrived. Davy rented a tiny apartment in Jacksonville in case he couldn't return home between games when the club was playing at home. June 10th. It was a beautiful day in Pensacola. Tracy went into labor about midday as scheduled. She asked her friend Alyssa to take her to Baptist Hospital, on our way to the hospital. She called Davy, who informed his manager and got in the car for the approximately five-hour drive. At 10.47 p.m., Evan and Jenna McComb welcomed their daughter after a six-hour labor. Evan, now an associate vice president at the accounting business where he worked, had the opportunity to cut the umbilical cord and was ecstatic. Dr. Leslie Scott congratulated the newlyweds, but was unable to attend because she was also giving delivery. She stepped out of the delivery room and down the hallway, where baseball star Davy Boyd and his fiancée, Tracy Strickland, were preparing for the birth of their first child. Dr. Scott fell in love with both a young baseball player and his older fiancée. Although the couple was not married, she noticed that the young athlete was very attentive for the older woman, who coped well with her first pregnancy despite her age of 36. While adding that having a first child at the age of 36 is not uncommon, Dr. Scott also stated that the dangers for a 30-year-old woman are greater than those for a 20-year-old woman. Tracy kept her weight under control during her pregnancy, gaining only pound 27. The doctor also noticed that the baseball player looked more excited about the pregnancy than his partner. Tracy stated to the doctor during a private consultation that she forced her soon-to-be ex-husband to undergo a vasectomy because she did not want children. The pregnancy was the outcome of a passionate moment that Davy and Tracy were unable to capture because they lacked condoms. This is not something that many couples have experienced, the doctor thought to herself while Tracy and the boy remained in Pensacola. Davy has returned to work in Jacksonville. Two weeks later, he was eating in a peaceful restaurant with an elderly woman when an agitated man approached them. Who is your friend? Cassie, does he know you're married? How many times have you experienced love already? He shouted at the couple. The restaurant became quieter. Davy gazed at Cassie, who looked at him. Cassie had stuttered countless times before. Davy slid out from behind the table, facing a man who appeared to be several inches smaller and lighter. When police and paramedics arrived at the restaurant, Davy was laying on the floor, bleeding from many slashes on his face. His right eye was closed and starting to turn blue. Harrison Walker, Cassie Walker's husband and a construction worker, had scrapes and bruises on his left-hand knuckles. His wife remained at the table, sobbing. Davy was still in the hospital when news of the event at the restaurant broke. It goes without saying that Marlin's management was not pleased when one of their high-priced acquisitions suffered a potentially career-ending eye injury. Tracy was also disappointed when she got the news, especially after learning that Davy had been at a restaurant with a married woman. The coincidence did not mislead her. Tracy shouted to no one. The noise awoke her infant, who started crying. No idiotic action goes unpunished. Richard Strickland couldn't help but smile as the woman assumed he was simply human. He'd heard about Davy's beating. He also had little sympathy for his ex-wife's predicament. She made a horrible decision. He thought to himself, slightly altering a memorable statement from the film Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Pensacola police declined to arrest Harris and Walker, particularly after witnesses claimed the baseball player began the altercation. Richard Strickland assigned one of his employees to find Harrison's cell phone number, and the mayor called the construction worker and gave him the name and phone number of his divorce lawyer. He also extended his heartfelt congratulations to the young man on defeating the baseball player. Two weeks later, Tracy and her kid, Frederick, named after Davy's favorite player, Freddie Freeman of the Atlanta Braves, moved into a smaller apartment that Tracy rented.
Tracy has directed her attorney to contact Davy to establish child support and visitation arrangements. She was still getting alimony from Richard. As autumn transitioned to winter, the Marlins' management became more anxious that Davy's cloudy vision would not improve. Insurance will cover the contract, but nothing can make up for the player's potential hits. Home runs, runs scored living as a single stay-at-home mom took its toll on Tracy, both mentally and physically. She appeared to have lost a significant number of friends since her divorce from Richard, and the few who remained seemed uninterested in spending time with a 30-year-old woman with a child. She only dropped half her postpartum weight before leaving Davy and gained approximately pound 15 in the 14 months she lived alone. Her stylish wardrobe was thrown to the back of her closet and was replaced by mom jeans and big sweatshirts. Her hair had grown longer and most days she simply wore it in a ponytail. The city's two-term mayor was standing on a quad in downtown Pensacola, watching an older woman push a stroller through an intersection when she twisted her ankle and fell to the ground. Being the gentleman that he was, Richard turned on his hazard lights, got out of the car and walked over to help the woman. He thought she looked familiar. He approached her, and when he helped her up, he was convinced of it. Hi, Tracy. Long time no see, Richard said quietly, looking into her face from the shock of the fall. Tracy did not recognize the person who came to her aid. The voice gave him away, forcing her to look more closely at her well-wisher. He looked like an older version of her ex-husband. Gray hair had already touched his hair. Wrinkles appeared on his forehead and around his eyes. His eyes weren't shining as brightly anymore. They had an empty look to them, despite the small smile he gave her. Thanks for your help, Richard. I guess I've gotten clumsy as I've gotten older, Tracy replied. If you are old, then what can we say about me? After all, I am five years older than you. Let me park the car and I'll give you and the baby a ride home. Tracy waited while Richard parked his car when he approached again. Tracy told him that she was well enough to walk home on her own, but if he had time, she wouldn't mind sitting down with him for a cup of coffee at the coffee shop half a block away. Richard thought her eyes looked more like a request than a question and nodded in agreement. Tracy pushed the stroller in front of them as they walked the half block to the coffee shop. Richard's brain was working at full capacity as they walked. He looked at the child's face, sadly, thinking that in another life this could have been their child. He shook his head to clear the thought, and Tracy gave him a quick side glance as he did so, having rid himself of this thought, at least for a while. Richard could not believe that the woman he was walking with was his ex-wife. Although only three years had passed since the divorce, Tracy seemed twenty years older during that time when he first saw her. Richard thought she was the grandmother of a child, perhaps aged 5,055. She only slightly resembles Tracy, who had once been his wife. Richard ordered coffee for himself, a salted caramel latte for Tracy and warm milk for the baby. He had to admit to himself that the child was beautiful, a good combination of both his mother and father. You remember how sweet, Tracy said as she tasted her latte. Richard blushed slightly. He simply ordered without thinking. It was a reflex. How are you doing, Tracy, if I'm not too intrusive? Are you seeing anyone? Tracy knew Richard wasn't trying to be intrusive. He was what? He always was a good guy. I haven't dated anyone since I broke up with Davy, Tracy replied quietly. It was a big shock to me. I guess karma really is a jerk, but it gave me a chance to feel what I gave you. Yes, it hurts. I guess it must give you some sense. Revenge. Tracy's voice died down. Tears appeared in her eyes. Richard sat silently. Once upon a time, he might have enjoyed her sad news, but after three years, his anger faded. Sadness replaced desire for revenge in his heart. I'm sorry to hear that, Tracy. Really, I mean it. I don't hate you anymore. I think, if anything, I feel sorry for myself and you. For what we lost and what could have would be... Still not sure why. It took me a long time to fully understand this. Richard Tracy admitted, I kind of lost myself for a while. I think I saw it as a way to satisfy my secret fantasy of being a bad girl. I felt like I deserved it and could keep you in the dark when in fact, I and I didn't hide it that much. I thought I could have the best of both worlds, and with my stupidity, I hurt a man and threw him away. I'm sorry, Richard. I mean it sincerely. Well, look at it this way, Tracy. Something good did come out of it all. He's a great kid, and at least you'll have him around enjoying him growing up. 
Tracy looked very guilty after that last statement. I know you didn't want kids, Tracy, but it happened. When God gives you lemons, make the best of it and never let him know he wasn't wanted. You have a great capacity for love. I know that firsthand. Tracy began to cry quietly after a moment. Richard handed her his handkerchief from his pocket. Of course, Tracy thought to herself. What about you, Richard? Is there someone in your life now? Please tell me I haven't ruined your attitude towards all women. There's no one right now, Tracy, but I'm an optimist. Nature, you know that. Richard said I'm probably still a little scared of commitment, but one day I'll get back on track. Tracy lowered her eyes to the table so Richard wouldn't see how guilty she felt. Richard felt uneasy. It was time to leave. He stood up to leave, but Tracy put her hand on his to stop him. Richard took the hint from his years together with Tracy in the past and sat back down. Richard, what are the chances? I mean, you're lonely. I'm lonely. I understand. I messed it up once with the best man a woman could ask for, but I... I wouldn't have made the same mistake if you had given me a second chance. I can promise you that. Tracy raised her eyes and looked straight at Richard. He had a thousand miles stare into the distance for five, maybe ten seconds, before he showed any emotion, finally frowning. God, I loved you so much, Richard whispered, causing Tracy to lean closer to him. I so wanted to believe that you were just flirting with him when I saw you together in that restaurant. I always knew that I was not the god of the Greeks, but I really believed that you loved me, maybe even loved me the same way as much as I do you. I gave up the chance to have kids. I really wanted kids. You knew that, but I gave it up because I loved you. Then you betrayed my love, betrayed my trust, and you topped it off by having a baby with that darn baseball player. I may not be angry anymore, but to forgive and forget. Not in this life, baby. Richard stood up, stroked the child's hair, and left. Thank you for spending the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this essay, please like it and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to share regarding your or someone else's circumstance, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.